Welcome to Church History and Theology, a study where we glean wisdom from those who came before us. Come, lay aside today's concerns for a bit and join in a study of the church throughout the ages. Our forebears have shaped our faith in countless ways. Let's go look into one of those influences today on Church History and Theology. Well, good evening, everyone. As we begin this second episode of our walkthrough here on the new series, we come across the subject of tonight's study, and that is why we study church history. It is quite a thing to express that we study church history and try to describe what it is, what its boundaries are, its parameters. But when we really get down to it, I believe one of the reasons why so few people spend their time studying church history has to do with not thinking that it in any way is meaningful. And so I wanted to take at the beginning of this new series an episode to discuss why we study church history. Church history is not something that's just fascinating, though it is fascinating in and of itself. It's not just a story of history and uh, intrigue and power and all the other things that go on in church history. It is not a way simply to establish oneself or to claim legitimacy for your church or another church or however the story goes. Um, And I hope you know me well enough to know that uh, that's not that's not how we study church history at all. Uh, No matter if you think yourself part of a church that's 2000 years old, there is no visible uh, church that has been without change for 2000 years. It doesn't really work like that. Um, and we will see that all through church history. Not, not any single organization has been consistent throughout all these years. So it, it, it cannot be for the establishment of oneself. And that's one of the things I really want to emphasize uh, when it comes to why study church history. Because there's a lot of people that when they, when they talk about the why for it, or the, uh, the, the purpose for studying church history, they get very myopic. They, they, they get very nearsighted and look at how can it benefit me? How can it benefit my organization? Or how can it benefit my claims of theological supremacy? Or however the case may be. Um, or rightness or correctness or historicity or any of these things. That is not the reason why you study church history. If that is the reason you study church history, then you're just going to end up with kind of this Whiggish view of things. This progressivist idea that uh, it finally has culminated in me lucky for all of history to finally culminate in somebody as awesome as myself. And that would have the exact opposite effect of what church history is. Um, As I argue church history, as I argued in the last episode, church history, I teach as an extension of Christian fellowship. And if Christian fellowship is all about you, then it's being done wrong. And if, if church history is, as I contest, a, an expression of Christian fellowship, then one of the outcomes of it ought to be humility. One of the outcomes of it ought to, be, ought to be a greater appreciation for the work of God, not just in your life, but in other people's lives as well. It should grow your faith. It should be a source of wisdom. It should be all of these things. And so that really does uh, emphasize for us the why of studying church history. And there's a whole other group of people who don't think church history affects them. And so they never study it. They probably uh, do not download podcasts on church history and and sit and wonder about these things or learn about them. And they don't think it affects them in any way. So um, before I even get into the the, uh, culling in any expectation that church history is about us and how it can benefit us, I do want to at least address the reality that church history does indeed affect us. This may seem strange at first to look at and say, why is, why is this one of the chief or one of the first uh, prime ways that you talk about why we study church history? Because if we're ignorant of the fact that it has affected us, we will never understand what forces have made us. We will never understand what forces have influenced our thinking uh, and what, what uh, influences continue to affect us. And we've never even analyzed them or considered them. Now, some may say, and I know this this happens in conservative Protestant circles, and I, well, I don't need church history, I have the Bible. 
Well, every time you open the Bible, uh, every passage you tend to go towards or, or passages you tend to stay away from are informed by the habits of other Christians, right? Um, do a little bit of thought experiment with me here for a second. How many of you, and be honest, how many of you have opened the book of Nahum recently, right? Uh, versus opening to something like the Gospel of John, for instance. Um, that reality that we all know is part of our habit is not just owed to us. We did not selectively choose to emphasize certain aspects of Scripture that has been informed by the habits of other Christians. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's there. And because it's there, it, it bodes well for us to study these things and to know what has affected us directly. Why is it that when I open up a certain passage in the book of Galatians that somebody's words whose name I probably don't know echoes in my ears as far as my interpretation, kind of giving me boundaries for what I'm allowed to see there or whatnot? Um, why, for instance, if I'm uh, say if I'm Catholic, do I see uh, the, the belief of purgatory in 1 Corinthians 3? Or why if, for instance, I see uh, the, uh, the commands of, of uh, or the instruction of Paul with regards to predestination is uh, someone like John Calvin sitting right next to me in Romans 9. Um, these types of influences are in our backgrounds. They are unavoidable. It already does affect us. And so if we do not study church history, and this really does get to the why as well, if we do not study church history, then we are really at the whim of being affected by those that we have not vetted uh, and we have not gone back to actually consider, is this a person or is this a group or is this a theological construct that I would like to have affecting me in one way or another? Um, as I come from a background that does not uh, place its trust into a singular organization, I understand also that there is those who listen to this show that do. You have uh, a church that you would hold to be an original church or the original church or the only church or however the case may be. It's going to be a little strange for you to listen to this whole series. Um, you're certainly welcome to uh, come alongside. Would love to have you. Um, but I'm not going to teach in a way that says... Uh, that there is certain ones that are endorsed that ought to inform you. Um, what I'm going to do is study this in a way to help us see which ones have affected us. Um, now, I am certainly going to sprinkle my opinion throughout here. Um, I believe there is all manner of wisdom to be garnered, both from those who are wise and those who are foolish. Um, those who are foolish, usually it is in the form of uh, avoidance, uh, and those who are wise uh, through emulation. And uh, it takes time sometimes and familiarity to understand those. So, but I do not go with a specific um, organized church with regards to who we pay attention to. So we try to pay attention to as many people as we possibly can here. And that's one of the things that I want to have us be able to do. Not only does it affect you, it already has affected you. Even the way you're listening to this show the reason for why you ever clicked on a uh, podcast or a show called Church History and Theology, it means that church history has already affected you one way or another. And some ways that's good, in some ways that's bad, but in all ways it is church history. And this is how we try to start to peel apart ways in which it has affected us, how it, is, uh, how it has influenced us. Um, I do not hold, for instance, that there is, uh, there is only one specific history that we need to pay attention to. I want us to pay attention to as broad a category of church history as we can. Uh, this doesn't mean everyone that claims to be a Christian I'm going to uh, consider a Christian. In fact, quite the opposite. There's many groups that consider themselves Christians that uh, are decidedly not. Um, but I think you'll find I'm, I'm quite broad with my definition of who is a Christian. Um, you know, while I am Reformed Baptist, I do also hold to the reality that you do not have to have perfect salvation, or excuse me, perfect theology in order to have salvation. Um, none of us has perfect theology, and so we can be wrong about things, and just because we are wrong about things about God does not mean that he cannot save us despite ourselves. Um, so, I, I think you'll find that I'm actually quite broad when I come to my definition of who is and who is not a Christian. Now, if they in their works bear out a life not keeping with the fruit of repentance, well, then we're going to have a whole other discussion. If somebody is in unbroken 
um, abuses of office or of simony or of all of these things. You'll see how it goes. Um, this kind of stuff, though, has already affected you, right? The way you listen to me, the way I speak, the way that we talk about these things, uh, evidences for the fact that whatever church we are a part of, whatever uh, background we have, we are already affected by church history. Uh, we are affected by it when we pick up our scriptures, not only in interpretation, but in how it's bound and how it's typed uh, and how it's laid out and whether it has references and whether it has study notes. When they, uh, all manner of things come down to us, all the ways in which we talk about certain aspects, uh, hardly able to have a discussion on the Trinity without referencing some of the language that comes from different church councils. That is, regardless of your opinion of church councils, that is in the language. You cannot escape it. And so it will inform it. Uh, whether you like it or not, it does not matter. It already has affected you and the ways in which you practice uh, your uh, expression of Christianity or your church's expression of Christianity, uh, your specific denomination, however it goes. Um, and really, it that pulls us into one of the more uncomfortable aspects about this that some people don't really like. And that is, why do we study church history? It really does show us why you believe what you believe. I know all of us thinks that we are the special snowflake sitting somewhere, you know, on a hill. I just have my Bible or I just have my saints or uh, canon law or tradition or um, liturgy or whatever the case may be and say, I I do not have to be affected by all these things. Here is my standard. Yeah, life's not that simple. Neither are humans. And certainly Christians aren't. When we, when we look at all of these uh, aspects of church history, when we express certain things that we believe, when we say, for instance, that, you know, Christians shouldn't drink alcohol or, um, you know, Christians should this or Christians should that, there is, there is a massive amount of history that's sitting behind you uh, that is influencing you. And again, those influences uh, have come down to you in your beliefs. They, these are not you just walking up to the scriptures or God just downloading his information to you and you say, well, if I feel right about this, then everything's okay. Um, that's not how the Christian life works. The Christian life was not meant to be singular. It was meant to be in concert with other Christians. Um, and I, I personally believe, and I hinted at this last week or last time, um, is I personally believe that God has specifically designed his church to live in the midst of multiple denominations. I do not believe that the goal is for the church to all be united here on earth. That has never been the case. I don't believe it ever will be the case. And it's not a goal of mine to make it the case. I don't think it should be anyone's goal. It doesn't mean that we don't pray as Christ did in John 17 for us to be one of one mind. Absolutely. But we are not all going to agree. We are not all going to come to agreement on things. We will differ on things. And I think that is just fine. Not to say that we're subjectivists. We're not. I am about as objective as it gets about these things. But I will say our perspectives on these things, as we see, are influenced by not only scripture, but by 2,000 years of history of all manner of people that we both reject and accept. And which ones we love, which ones we prefer, uh, regardless of if you are a part of a church that uh, declares certain things and says these things are off limits, those ones are not, and all of this stuff, still you have favorites. You have influences that you prefer and things that you emphasize. And I'm not, I'm not overly individualizing this. I'm just simply saying it's going to, in the, in the final analysis, it is going to affect you particularly and what you believe, especially when you come down to what church you attend to. That may be as, as recent in your experience as where your parents went, and they are a part of church history as well. That has affected you. It has affected your beliefs, the pastor you've listened to, or the priest you listen to, or, um, or, the, um, uh, or the way in which you have uh, come to the conclusions you have. All of these things are an expression of church history, and this is one of the reasons why we study it is because it has already affected you, it is in your belief system, it is in your experience, and we pull it apart to understand where it all came from. And I find that particularly helpful. There's two aspects, though, going forward that I really want to talk about. 
and with regards to why we study church history. One of them is focused on God. The other one is focused on his people. So let's start with the most important, and that is God. When we talk about the history of the church, we're addressing the reality that long focus helps determine God's actions. Long focus helps determine God's actions. We've all been susceptible to nearsightedness. Um, we, we may be a part of a church that, you know, something really nice happened that we really, um, uh, we really appreciated, you know, favorable circumstances. We've paid off the church's mortgage or something like this. And we will focus more on that and say that that is a blessing of the Lord. It certainly is. There's all manner of things that are blessings of the Lord. Um, and we will focus on that. And, and I've seen this happen multiple times. We will assume that God is more exclusively working in our lives than in anybody else's lives because we have a front row seat to it. And this does not help in humility, um, which we're going to talk about next. Long focus helps pulls us, pull us out of this. It has the same effect of traveling around the world and meeting Christians that are not uh, from your culture, that do not speak your language, and to realize that Christianity is a lot bigger than you. Um, and studying church history helps us with that as well. It gives us a long focus or a broader focus, and it helps determine where God is at work everywhere in the world, not just in the places that we are. When we get that nearsighted, we tend to forget that, um, that God is at work in places other than us, that God is at work with people that differ than us. Um, and this is something that the modern era with all of our ability of transportation and communication has really opened up the world. Um, we are not only aware of, but we're able to communicate with, uh, Christians of very different denominations and in very different cultures than we have ever gotten to do at any other point in history. Now that leads to a lot of clashes that leads to a lot of disagreements, um, even some ribbing, but in the end, we have to work through this as part of our growing pains because it is a long focus that we are aiming at here. All of us, I believe, I hope, are sincere enough to say that we are looking to understand where God is at work in the world. We may differ. In fact, we certainly do differ on where exactly we understand God to be at work in the world. But I would, I would hope that every Christian I run into, whether it be uh, somebody from the East, whether it be somebody from South Africa, whether it be somebody from uh, Rome, whether it be somebody from Alabama or New York or Washington State or Chile, if I would if I would come across this person, I would hope that one of their goals would be to determine where God is at work in the world. And their interaction with you and your interaction with them should help us understand that. When we go to and extrapolate that to church history, this is what I'm talking about. And it's one of the reasons why I want to study things that I typically did not get to study when I walked through church history my first times. And that is churches in the East, churches in Ethiopia, um, even some of the Assyrian churches of the East. And now, uh, again, I'm going to go into places that some would consider off limits. Um, I don't consider that kind of stuff off limits. I don't even describe heresy necessarily as wrong belief, but really more of wrong belief that leads to uh, an interruption of salvation, that that it actually breaks up the preaching of the gospel in one way or another. Um, obviously, something like, you know, Jesus not being God directly would um, affect how the gospel functions uh, and and quite in a in, in a desperate way, and so that would be something that would I would be considering off limits. But when we're talking about a difference of whether uh, this uh, this church was in league with uh, the certain patriarchs of this or the bishops of that or the pope of this, those kind of things I'm I'm almost always going to ignore. Um, I don't believe much has ever happened good in church history through. Uh, or ever the perspective of what God was doing exclusively through us simply because somebody was paying attention to what God was doing uh, only with them and then forgot that, you know, God is a little bit bigger than just that. Um, and that goes to my next point as well. And that is, why do we study church history? It cultivates humility. Only when it's done right. 
there's a lot of people that know church history. There's a lot of people that know church history better than me. There's a lot of people that know church history better than you. But I will say this, if one of the goals of studying church history is not to uh, achieve some level of humility about oneself and one's church, no matter how many facts about church history you know, no matter how many things you can rattle off, if it does not result in humility, you are doing it wrong. You are a Christian. You are studying church history as an extension of fellowship. I hope you are studying church history as an extension of fellowship. And the goal of that, one of the main goals of that should be humility. This is the primary virtue of the Christian life. The opposite of this is pride. If you go into studying church history, you want to know if you have your why mixed, mixed up. If you go into studying church history and you come out proud and just beaming with pride, you're doing it wrong. You should be doing this as a Christian. Every part of the fruit of the Spirit should be at work in you when you are studying church history. <coughs> when we talk about the why of these things, humility has to be at one of the tops of the list. When we learn about not only that there are so many different theological views, but we also learn that maybe ours isn't as original as we thought. Maybe ours isn't as clear as we thought. Maybe ours isn't as apostolic as we thought. Maybe our history doesn't go back to the very beginning as we were taught. Maybe some things happen in church history that we don't know yet. Um, perhaps there's some things that have gone on that we would absolutely cringe to learn. These types of things are reality in church history. In fact, there is nobody in the first century that looks and talks and believes and thinks exactly like anyone currently in the world today. There is no first century apostolic church in the world today. The reason being is all the people that God had to live in the first century apostolic church are dead. Okay? Today is the 21st century. God did not have you born at the wrong time. You are here on purpose. And you are listening to this on purpose. I, I believe in the providence of God to such a minute scale. And one of the reasons why we don't aim to go back to the first century or we don't aim to just emulate the first century is we're not there. We're here. We have to be in charge of carrying out the Christian virtues in a 21st century context, wherever we are. And the way we do that is by cultivating humility, even in our study of these past 20 centuries. We don't look back to say, well, here's how I'm right and you're wrong. There's a lot of places where we're going to see that. But here's the thing. Everybody is wrong. There is no church organization that does not have its hands all manner of dirty uh, throughout history. Because here's the thing. They're made up of humans. Humans that still sin. Humans that still have problems. And if we go into it going, my team is better than your team, good. Study it longer and you're going to find out that both teams are worse than you think. Always has been. And so when we come out of these things, we should not only be seeing it for its value of what it is, but in referencing what God has been doing in the world, it should teach us a great deal of humility that he actually uses people like us, who are probably going to screw up the church just as much as the people before us did. But God is faithful, and he continually grows his church. And by that, I mean the invisible church. I do not mean your church organization. The invisible church will ever be grown by the Father. And as the Son continually intercedes, and as the Spirit continually indwells, we will see the work of God, and it will make us humble. And this goes into how we think about our churches. I believe one of the most helpful byproducts of studying church history has been a complete and utter overhaul in the way I've thought of ecclesiology or the study of the church. It, <clears throat> it is perhaps one of the hardest things to, gris, uh, to grasp that perhaps the way you think about church or worship or the gathered assembly um, is not perfect or original or apostolic or ideal or whatever the case may be. And many church organizations lie to themselves that theirs is apostolic, theirs is original. Everyone has always done it this way. Had somebody 
uh, tell me that <laughs> this week, actually, that their church has, uh, it, it carries on the exact tradition, the way that everyone has always done it ever since the very beginning. That's nonsense. There's no church that does it like that. Everyone has had some level of development. Everyone has had some level of change. Everyone has had desires to reform and attempts to reform and some that get lax in things, some that try to preserve things, some that try to change things and then go back and you have more reformation movements. There's so many different changes that have happened over the years that it is nonsensical to say that my organization is the original one. There isn't. It doesn't work like that. When we talk about ecclesiology and the definition of the church or what it is, um, I have come more and more of the opinion, the more I study church history, uh, the deeper this gets, is that there is no organization worth putting any trust in. I don't mean you don't go to church. Absolutely, you, you attend church. I mean your trust better be solely put in Christ, not in the church. The church will let you down. I mean, it doesn't matter what denomination you're part of. I don't care how solid it is. It's kind of one of these things of this world. Turn the clock forward a little bit of time, and you're going to find it disappointing you. Um, you know, I, and again, how how people think through these things, how they deal with these things, is different based on you know what you uh, what you think about the state of the church. And you may think this, the same as I thought in my late twenties when I. Uh, first became a pastor is that, you know, if as long as I can make an ideal church, everything should be fine. It took me several years to realize that there is no such thing as an ideal church. And studying church history helped me see that there never has been an ideal church. The first century church was not an ideal church. The second century church was not an ideal church. Never did we quote unquote, get it right. Because again, the church is never here to fix the whole world. It is not here to inform all of the things that are to go on. It is here to be an expression of the righteousness of God in the midst of a crooked world. Now we see the kingdom of heaven breaking in. As the scriptures say, we are receiving a kingdom. It is something that is gradual. It is something that is breaking in. It is something that is taking over the world. And it goes out into all the nations of the world on the authority of Christ. We understand this. How exactly that looks, many Christians have seen in many different ways. It doesn't mean they're all equally right or all equally wrong. It just means there's massive differences, and yet somehow, in the midst of all of this insanity, Christ is growing his church. And we may not always be able to see it. In fact, I can assure you we won't. But it will at least appreciate in our minds how God has been at work. And that's one of the things that I'm really quite grateful for. Uh, somebody asked me this week, actually, with regards to uh, my view on uh, communion or or Eucharist. You know, um, why do I see it? Uh, why do I? Why would I see it as a memorial meal, for instance, as being a valid thing? What's the point of that? And I said, well, in in my tradition, in my habit and way of thinking, I look at it as as being born out of Passover, <coughs> as having the same role that Passover had for the Israelite people. Um, I don't look at it as a, a, a place of sacrifice or of mass or anything like this. I said, I see memory as something that solidifies in us when we remember Christ as often as we eat and drink of it. And the question came back, you know, what what's the role of solidified memory? I said, well, it teaches us to trust God more. It increases our faith. We realize his promises, we realize his faithfulness in the past, and we realize then his faithfulness in the future. And I say that church history has a lot to do with this as well. This is part of the, um, it's about God and his purposes in the world. One of the things that I did not expect in studying church history, and this really speaks into the why we do it, is it does help temper our extremities. There is a habit in the world, there's a habit in the church, to lose focus, um, to lose focus of how hard some people have had life before. And so we imagine if our theology is expecting that the world gets really bad and then it ends, 
then when our little corner of the world gets bad, we expect the end of the world to come. Um, but I believe that it is far more complicated than this. I believe that there is much bigger story going on than I think anyone imagines. Um, there's a lot of opinions in the area of eschatology and last things and the purpose of the church and the outcome of it, the end of the church, the eternal state and all of these. And you say, why would that be related to the study of church history? It, it's directly related to it because some of the most extreme aspects of expectations have almost always led to people losing their faith. When it comes to people making predictions about the end of the world, or when it comes to people saying, I will set up a city, or I will set up a city state, or I will set up a country, or a church state, or a, an amalgam of state and church together that will bring about uh, this almost perfect utopia of church on earth, or of heaven on earth through the church, it always fails. Always. And so rather than us trying to take the promises of God into our own hands and bring them about, it really does, in studying church history, help temper our extremities with this. There's a lot of people that have predicted that Christ is coming back on this date or that date or that date. They're all wrong, every single one of them. They always have been. They always will be. This is not something that we are told to be able to do. What we are told to be able to do is to watch and wait and to be patient and to endure our trials in a manner that brings us the joy of patience. That patience may have its complete and perfecting work. And so when I say <coughs> one of the whys of studying church history is it helps tempers our eschatology, just read the word patience in there. It teaches us humility. It teaches us patience. It teaches us to wait for God's timing for things rather than to force the hand. God has his purpose, right? He gave the church for a reason. He gave the state for a reason. He gave these things not so that we can mix them all together and make things happen. He gave them separately. He gave them with different intentions, with different goals, with different ministries. And when we get impatient, when we think that we can hurry along the plan of God, that's when we make our massive errors. And that is one of the great warnings of church history is to look into how people have tried to, let's say, hurry along the kingdom of God and have stepped directly into it. So that really covers the why of church history with regards to the focus on God. Let's let's focus on people, right? One of the great aspects of studying church history is the learning of faithfulness of people that have gone before us. Our brothers and sisters have endured, have written, have lived and died and carried on in ways that are impressive. And not just impressive, but faithful. They join the cloud of witnesses that stands before us, made up of the prophets and the apostles. And every single Christian that came before us is part of this cloud of witnesses of faith that we emulate. And in studying their stories, in studying the way that they talk about their life, the way that they see God, these things help us. <clears throat> it is no different than the fellowship of the church that you fellowship with on, uh, on a weekly basis. The stories of God's intervention in their life, their comfort in his promises, regardless of how the circumstances are dire. These types of things, <coughs> excuse me, these types of things consistently speak to us of the clarity of God's promises with regards to the hopes he actually promises to us. He doesn't promise us simple lives or easy lives. He doesn't promise to us lives with no pain. He actually promises us quite the opposite, actually, and speaks to us of his enduring presence in our lives and his faithfulness and our preservation. It's kind of a remarkable thing. This is not to say that we study church history for selfish reasons. No, um, we grow our faith, not so that we can hold it to ourselves. No, no more would we hold our faith to ourselves than uh, as we are told in the 
um, in the Sermon on the Mount, the light that God has put within us, uh, we are to have shine out into this world. Um, our faith is not just to be held to ourselves. It is to actually be lived out in the midst of this world. Not so that people see our good works and glorify us, but know that they see our good works and glorify our Father because they recognize where these things come from, where where patience in tribulations come from, um, where peace, true peace, comes from. It's not just about those things. It is that we actually have generations of Christians that come after us that we need to live faithful examples for as well and to pass down the gospel. It helps us instead also to avoid the pitfalls. This is perhaps the one if you ever see somebody post up <clears throat> or um, talk about or give a message about why we study church history, this is the one that everyone always focuses on. Um, and I put it here near towards the end because I don't believe that it is one of the main reasons. I believe it is a minor reason, but it's a helpful one and certainly a legitimate one. Uh, and that is pitfall avoidance. Um, those who don't study church history are, are doomed to fall into some of the traps that people in church history have already fallen into. There really is nothing new under the sun. Uh, all of the failures we are seeing today, all of the capitulations we are seeing today have happened before. Uh, they will happen again, and uh, that will keep going. And how we avoid such things really has a lot to do with how we approach church history. Uh, and so one of the reasons why we study it, why we do not want to make the mistakes of the past. We've already learned that that doesn't work. And just from a pragmatic perspective, I don't want to do stuff that doesn't work. I would rather do things that work. I would rather focus on the nature of the world as it is, uh, rather than I was, I would prefer it to be. I don't want to interact with the world with my, uh, eyes wide shut. I don't want this, this uh, idea that everything going on in the world is not uh, really going on. The stuff that's going on, we have to interact with. Uh, we can't just interact with the world in a way that we would prefer it to be, right? Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> as Christians, we have a message that transcends all of these things. And one of the great pitfall avoidances that we can say is that there is nothing that is worth our actual Christian testimony. I would rather be uh, a fool, yet still preaching the gospel. I would rather uh, a church building not be beautiful. As much as I love gorgeous architecture, I'd rather something utilitarian rather than nothing at all. I would rather uh, just a, a painted white wall rather than distractions and people not actually having faith in Christ. Uh, whatever the case may be, call me pragmatic, call me low church minded. I, I look, I love Gothic cathedrals. I love these types of things. But if, if, if that stuff distracts us in any way from Christ, I will pull away from it in a moment. That includes everything, flags, statues, icons. I don't care what it is. If it distracts us from Christ in any way, or it, inf or it, it or it provides a fertile, uh, situation for some people for idolatry or whatnot, then I will immediately rid myself of it. Uh, those types of things are not worth it. And that's one of the great pitfalls that church history always sees repeated is a, a return to such things. Uh, and so that's one of the great reasons to study church history. It is uh, one of the minor ones, but it's a good one anyway, and that is to avoid such things. And this brings me to one of my final points, and that is the grounding of Christian identity. When we see our brothers and sisters in generations gone by being faithful to the Lord, no matter how they were challenged. When we see truth triumph over lies, we are encouraged. We see our siblings doing what they are meant to do. As God continually grows his people up, we see faithfulness when it shines through. We do. Now, there's going to be some times as we go through church history, that we're going to see Christians going up against Christians or people calling themselves Christians going up against people calling themselves Christians. And you may not agree with what side I take on these things. That's okay. Um, when it, when it comes down to it, you're going to understand why I 
choose certain sides. There's some times where there's no Christians on any side. There's some times where there's legitimate Christians on both sides of the issues. And they are going to war against one another. And these are lamentable things. These are frustrating things. But they are part of the Christian identity. And I think it's one of the things that really helps us from taking too hard of a stance and too militaristic a stance on any one particular thing because it tends to drive us to the extremities uh, and the extreme reactions of things that, in the end, there's there are important things, sure. But in the end, who we are as Christians really is far more important than exactly how it is all of our history has occurred. When we look into church history, this, this really is born out of an understanding that we cannot analyze every Christian that has been. We can only see what we can see. I believe personally the most influential Christians in all of history are people whose names we do not know. I believe we will be utterly surprised to find out who the most influential people in church history were because it is not people like Augustine, as influential as he is and as awesome as his writing is. It's not people like Luther, right? It's not people like Constantine. <coughs> I believe God works in ways that are mysterious and that are beyond our purview. And while we can pay attention to the things that are revealed to us, while we can pay attention to the things that we know and can come to a full attention of, we cannot appreciate exactly yet those things that we have not seen. And exactly who has affected what in church history through prayer, through miracle, through in intercession. I don't believe we will ever know this side of heaven. And so there's a great deal of humility that comes even in the own study of church history. Um, we don't know everything. We know actually quite very little about history. Most of the time we only know those things that we prefer to know. Um, you know, we, we know those quotes of the church fathers that we like, or we know, uh, those certain theologians in history that we like, the ones that we agree with, the ones that we like, uh, the ones that back us up. But one of the things I want to say here before we even get, be uh, before we even begin into the history of the church and, and opening up the study of, uh, of church history total, I want to get us into this mode to think about, the expansion of Christian identity in our minds. How is it we see the value of these things far, <clears throat> far broader than we have before? And if there's anything that I can encourage you in, it would be that. I want you to be able to appreciate the scope of church history being far beyond anything you expect. So why study church history? We study church history because it is our family's history. These are our brothers and sisters. And our Father is the God who is driving all of this to its sure end. And may God make us patient until that end. That is really what I hope to do. When we continue through this, next time we're together, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the theological concept of the church, of Christ as its head. <clears throat> the fountain from which all of these things flow, from where all of its direction is taken, and he has come to this earth to find his bride and find her he has and he is saving her and perfecting her and one day we will all be at the marriage supper of the lamb i will say this at the front end of this you may agree with me you may disagree with me i really don't i i don't lose any sleep over these things but i will say this <coughs> let's walk through this together let's try to find a way to expand our understanding of how the church functions and how it works so that we can actually appreciate one another rather than just fighting constantly. Because all of the fights in church history have not really amounted to much. Um, I believe that the denominations are intentional. I believe that they are good. I believe they're healthy, but only if we conduct one oh, with, excuse me, only if we conduct ourselves amongst each other with humility that is present in the Christian virtues. And so I'm going to commit to that. I'm going to have you hold me to it as I go forward. There are some things that as we come across, they are going to make me upset. 
There are some things that are going to make you upset. That's fine. These are real things. People in families get upset at one another. That is that is okay. Uh, I'm not here saying, oh, everybody's a Christian everywhere. No, I'm saying I can't make the call on people's hearts, but what I can do is see if whether or not it's consistent with Christian witness. Is it consistent with how Scripture describes these things? Is it is it sufficiently expressed to us that we can know these things? I want us to be able to emphasize those things that are uh, of necessity to help us understand church history, that we may be able to uh, appreciate it from a much better vantage point, I think, than before. If you want to join me in that, we're on that path. Let's work towards it, uh, and let's grow with one another. Let's fellowship in church history. That's what I really hope for. <clears throat> well, until next time, um, I am very grateful that you're on this journey with me, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, just the same as it is before. In a couple weeks, we will be discussing Christ as head of the church, invisible, and throughout all of time, and how exactly that works. More theological and ecclesiology, uh, ecclesiology. So, looking forward to that. Until then, may God bless you all. Lord's blessings.